Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the Bible, from the very beginning to the very end, we see many relationships described and also God's will for relationships prescribed. Many of those examples that we see in the Bible of those relationships are are broken and damaged beyond repair. Some however, later are repaired. Some are celebrated. Some of those relationships are useful and and productive. Some are are saving, sanctifying relationships. Think about your life. We, We live with so many relationships with others in our lives. For many, perhaps most of us, Our family is most important, whether that's our immediate nuclear family or members of our extended family that we have close relationships with. And in that family, we relate to each other sometimes in healthy ways, uh, but sometimes also we relate to each other with some amount of difficulty. And sometimes there are such uh, strife and tension in our relationships Sometimes that there is even a divorce or, or a total split or separation, a total breakdown of all communication and good feeling. But we begin with a relationship of love, of respect, of life together. And as we mentioned also here in the church, we have relationships. We have a pastor as a spiritual leader. We have officers of the congregation, members of the ministry council who take care of administration and uh, lead various organizations within our church. We have elders and teachers with whom we relate in other ways who are responsible for spiritual oversight and teaching of God's word. In this dynamic organization of our congregation, we want to live together with each other as fellow believers in peace and harmony. We want to fulfill our opportunities to serve Christ and to serve one another in the church and in our community around us. And of course, also we have relationships at work with our supervisors, with our co-workers, with the other staff and and, uh, employees of the company. And of course, add to those relationships then all the relationships that we have in our communities and with our friends whether it's uh, people that we go uh, with together to watch a ball game at at a park or at at home, uh, go out fishing or hunting or play cards or or other games or or whatever it might be. In those relationships, there are many sorrows, sometimes petty jealousies, little troubles that often rob us of happiness and joy and that could perhaps bring early uh, worry lines and wrinkles to our faces? Well, all too often, we or they have wandered away from God and from his truth. It is the life that walks in constant and intimate communication with our blessed Savior that gives us our real joy and direction in life and in all those relationships that God has placed us in. And so in our sermon text today from Hebrews chapter 2, God addresses especially, first of all, our spiritual relationship, our relationship with him. And then as a result of that, how through his love and forgiveness, we can repair any broken relationships that we have with others in our lives. God tells us in his word that those breaks and strains and and tears and and total separations in relationships come about as the result of, of sin. Of course, sin is not a popular topic in society today, but as God tells us in his word through his apostle John, if we say that we have no sin, we are really deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. There's no easy or soft way of proclaiming this truth to someone. We shouldn't make light of sin. We shouldn't pretend that there is no sin. No, our sermon text faces that subject quite directly, in fact. The writer to the Hebrews very clearly and candidly indicates that the relationship with which he is dealing also is is not God's relationship with the angels. He explains that uh, the angels were not the ones for whom Jesus uh, uh, humbled himself 
took on another form in order to save them. We, as we see throughout the history of the Bible, angels have always been important in the ministry of God as he deals with humankind, the crown of his creation. God's mighty angels, these powerful spiritual beings, carry on messenger work of various kinds for God. But the writer to the Hebrews says in verse 16 of our reading that it is not angels that he helps. No, when God developed his plan for restoring the relationships in the world that he has created, as far as we know, that plan of God's did not include the restoration of his relationship with the angels who had fallen and rebelled against him, the devil and, and those angels who, who joined with him in rebellion and therefore became evil angels or demons. Now, of course, that subject is, is somewhat of a, a side note to the main point of the sermon text that we have before us, which is that, that matter of God's relationship with us and then our relationship with others around us. We see as we study God's word that broken relationships, our relationship with God especially, is not repaired through negotiation. How did God plan to restore the relationship that initially had existed in the Garden of Eden between himself and Adam and Eve in that perfect state that he had created them in? Well, if he had trusted their efforts, human efforts, to repair that breach between themselves and God, well then, still today, we as descendants of Adam and Eve, so many hundreds or thousands of generations later would, would very likely still be trying to continue that negotiation with God. Our human way of thinking uh, thinks, well, we should meet in the middle. So God, if, if you uh, give a little bit, well, then, then we will also give. We'll meet you halfway. Uh, God, if, if you'll relax a little bit about the sixth commandment, well, then we'll step up our efforts in obeying the eighth commandment. Perhaps we'd even try to put some pressure on God to demonstrate how good we are in order to gain some extra points with him. We'd advise him that we would be willing to meet him for a conference, for negotiations, in order to, to hammer out some kind of compromise, some kind of deal that both he and we can agree to. But when it comes down to it, you and I know what God demands. He's very clear about it in his word. God demands perfection from us. Perfect obedience of all of his commands, not just some of the time, all of the time, not just outwardly, but also in the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts and minds as well. And when we measure up our lives, our actions, our words, and certainly our thoughts and desires according to that standard, we must all admit that we all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all have fallen short of that standard of perfect obedience that he requires. But through his son, Jesus, God has accomplished the restoring of relationships. As the writer to the Hebrews puts it in verse 9 of our reading, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. And by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. That is God's way of repairing and restoring broken relationships. Over the last 2,000 years of the history of the Christian church, since Jesus came and died and, and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, there have been many, many tragedies over those centuries. Many people in our own generation consider the Christian religion to be something soft, something for people who are weak-willed and weak-minded. Some people who, who maybe don't believe in Jesus as their Savior but do admit that the death of Jesus on a cross really occurred, they don't see him as the Savior of the world, but they see him as an abject failure. Someone who had potential to lead a rebellion, to lead a movement, but who ultimately was destroyed by his enemies, defeated by life, utterly crushed by the cross. But as God tells us in his word, that in fact was his way of salvation for you and me and for everyone in the whole world. 
education, no matter how detailed, difficult, or thorough, does not make people princes in God's kingdom or princesses. There is only one way, and that is through Jesus' death and through the faith in what he has done for us that God has given to us by his Holy Spirit through word and sacrament. The value of Jesus' suffering for our relationship with God is shown by the writer to the Hebrews in verse 18 of our text. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted, which is you and me, every day of our lives. God made the author of our salvation perfect through suffering. And so now as a result, now the wonderful truth of God's love for us is that he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. We have become children of God, God the Father's own sons and daughters whom he dearly loves because of his adoption of us into his family through the gift of faith in Jesus as our Savior that he has given to us through his word, through the washing of of the water with the word in baptism, strengthened in us through further teaching of the good news of his love through Jesus, through the, the assurance of his forgiveness in the Lord's Supper. Through this faith in our Savior Jesus, we have become heirs of his inheritance, of the glory of heaven. We have become literally the brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He is the firstborn in the family. The prophet Isaiah said, Here am I and the children God has given to me. For us who in our lives are so familiar with broken relationships, the excitement of being in the family of God gives us true cause for celebration. We have a relationship of faith with him. Again, in our baptism, he came to each one of us through his word, through the forgiveness of sins and holy communion. He continues to offer us the means for strengthening our faith, for forgiveness, and for constant renewal in that relationship with him. And so today, let us hear his word of reconciliation and of grace. Follow him as he leads us. And as he warns us, there is no room in this relationship for lukewarmness, for half measures. We come with a clear yes or no with regard to the message about Jesus. We don't evade the issue. It would be so easy uh, constantly to postpone living in a relationship with Jesus because of the challenges that that may present for us and for the lifestyle we might want to lead, uh, going along with the, the ways of the world around us, the ways that go against God's will. So why not just wait until we're later in life, until we're closer to the time when we'll have that final reckoning with God, and then we can repent and turn to him after we've enjoyed all, all the years in between living in the way that we want to live. God says, no, you don't know when that end will be for you, when the end of the world might come with the return of Jesus. God says, today is our opportunity. Jesus is our captain, our champion, our leader. He guides us. He shows us the way. He himself has made the way for us by his death on the cross in our place. He leads us. As Christians, we have enlisted under his banner. And although we may have to endure hardship, as good soldiers of Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, we know that we will be brought safely to inherit great glory and honor with him in heaven. Christ is the one who works in all of this. We are simply the recipients of his grace. We are sanctified. We are made holy, endowed with holy principles and powers, separated from the sinful world around us and set apart for the high and holy purposes and uses that God has planned for us to do. This relationship is illustrated in the quotation from Psalm 22 that we have in our reading. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. 
We're not just brothers and sisters to one another, but brothers and sisters to Christ Jesus, our Savior. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Are we ashamed to call him our Lord and Savior? By his grace, may we never be. We acknowledge him as our captain. We recognize his suffering for our salvation. We accept his death and resurrection for the full forgiveness of all of our sins as he assures us. And we live with thanksgiving in that relationship with him and recognize each other as brothers and sisters through faith in him. We recognize each person around us as a soul for whom Jesus died, as someone for whom Jesus gave up his life, for whom he suffered the agony of, of the torture under the hands of Pontius Pilate and his soldiers and the extreme spiritual agony on the cross of the punishment of God the Father for the sins of the whole world. Jesus suffered that for that person that we can't stand, that we, that we don't get along with, for that person who has wronged us. Jesus paid for their sins just as he paid for mine. And so he calls on us to remember that truth, that we are no more special, no better than the person with whom we have had a strained relationship. God calls on us to, to do what we can to repair that relationship, remembering how much he has forgiven us and motivated by his love, being glad and willing and eager to reflect that forgiving love that he has toward us to that person who has harmed us or whom we have harmed and have a strained relationship to go first and to, to bridge the gap and to, to repent and to forgive as he has done for us. And when we have that relationship, when we remember the relationship of his grace and his mercy and love, in this life we celebrate and we look forward to that eternal celebration at the side of, of our Heavenly Father before the throne of our brother Jesus, our Savior, and with so many brothers and sisters in faith in him. Amen.